go. So welcome, this is the uh, 25th of November Interledger Community Call. Uh, on the agenda today, myself and John Freef are going to go through a presentation of Tiger Beetle. It's a um, accounting, purpose-built accounting database um, that we've been working on for the last while. I say we, um, she's been very generous to me. John has done most of the hard work here. Um, John will join us a little bit later on to give some demos, but uh, to kick us off, I'm going to go through a presentation uh, just explaining some of the motivations and the um, the rational design decisions and so on that we've been through. Uh, some background on this, um, this has been sort of a, a pet project of mine for a long time, a project that was just an idea for a very long time. Um, so having worked on Intelligia for or a few years um, when I was, when, when Matt and Don and myself were building the very first versions of Rafiki a couple of years ago, um, we were really like wrestling with this idea of trying to um, do sort of balance tracking with really, really high throughput of transfers um, in a safe way. So like doing it, you know, without having any risk of, um, you know, notifying third parties of the transaction and then actually timing out and not having a record of things that have happened and so on. Um, so I've kind of wanted to I wanted to build this for a long time and now my dream is being realized by proxy. So um, we had a, finally had an excuse to build it uh, as part of a performance work stream and the Moduli project, which we which we contribute to. So Moduli, um, the Moduli project is a uh, payments hub or a central sort of payments processing clearing system for mobile money that we contribute to. It's an open source system. And they had a work stream of last year also exploring how they could improve the performance of the system. And currently the way the system works is it uses a combination of Kafka and uh, MySQL for its persistence. And so whenever a transfer is processed by Moduloop, there's a lot of database queries and Redis calls and sorry, use Redis as well and Kafka um, uh, pub publishing and subscriptions and so on going on for a single transfer. Um, and so, so one of the approaches to solving that was a, a rethink of the architecture and a proof of concept was built recently um, to switch to a sort of event sourced CQRS model, um, which has dramatically improved the performance. Uh, an alternative approach with Joran and Don were pursuing was just to optimize what's already there. So um, looking at ways they could reduce the number of network requests, database requests, and so on. Um, but what this led to was us finally um, proposing that a, a more purpose-built uh, accounting database would potentially be the, the best solution. And so Joran and Don built a, a proto beetle, the first prototype of Tiger Beetle in TypeScript and confirmed our sort of back of the envelope calculations that it was going to be a lot more performant than um, a, an application on top of a generic database. And that um, was enough motivation to go off and start building Tiger Beetle. So uh, this is now Alpha Beetle, as Joran likes to call it, which is sort of the, the first uh, iteration of Tiger Beetle written in Zig. So Zig um, is a new low-level program, a relatively new low-level programming language. Um, allows you to get sort of the power of writing in C or C++, but with a, what appears to be a much cleaner language. I'm not a C or C++ programmer, so I don't have any <laughs> relative experience to compare it to. Um, but certainly, like, we, we, we'll have a look a bit at Joran's code, and you'll see it's, it's really um, very easy to understand, does some really nice stuff, uh, um, sort of uh, in terms of things like zero copy, um, you know, reading off, off, the, net, off the network and writing to disk with, with no uh, memory copies required. Um, uh, very, very uh, easy sort of uh, serialization and deserialization of data, although it's not truly really serialization, it's, it's sort of read structures straight out of the network and so on. Anyway, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but uh, that's that's some of the background behind Tiger Beetle. Um, 
it's a, a purpose-built database that just does accounting. Um, it's designed for very high throughput, um, very low latencies, and it supports two-phase commits of each transfer. So um, Modulup is, is using um, Interledger at its heart as well, so conditions and performance. And so um, Tiger Beetle supports that, and as a result is you know, a great option for building potentially a very high-speed connector. Um, oh, so the, the first problem in building a, a um, this kind of a database or, or, or a system that processes um, balance updates uh, persistently is, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's very difficult because you have to, um, you have to obviously process every transfer in serial. You can't parallelize, um, the work to process, uh, transfers against the same balance because each transfer has to refer to the current balance. Um, in the business logic in processing a transfer has to refer to the current balance. So that will obviously change after each event. Um, which you know is a challenge because most people today when they want to scale systems up or find the performance simply just um, split the work in parallel and you know we write lots of lots of stateless systems and you know scale them out horizontally um the challenge here is obviously you you start to you know, sacrifice uh performance or, or and or safety um and and so obviously you know people are using like generic databases or redis or um, we've internally at Coil, we've managed to get some pretty decent performance out of using something like Redis, um, writing some Lua scripts to do some of the business logic in, in Redis. Uh, and that's one of the tricks we apply on Tiger Beetle as well as moving the, the business logic closer to the data. Um, but what Tiger Beetle attempts to do is, is do all of this, you know, be, be built specifically for this purpose. So the second problem you have um, is, especially in a payments network, and this is one that um, Modulub suffers from especially, is that if you are not an end edge uh, node, so if you're a middle node, in other words, you only have a small number of peers um, or small number of account balances that you're tracking, but you still have a very high throughput of transactions, um, then you're especially impacted by, uh, by this problem because uh, parallelization of your work is limited by the number of accounts. Uh, there are tricks you can do to sort of um, shard liquidity on a single account. So you can imagine if an account has, let's say a balance of $1,000, um, you could split that and make it two accounts of 50 each, but then you've got a lot of complexity there, sorry, 500 each, a lot of complexity there where you have to be constantly rebalancing and making sure um, the total liquidity is, you know, is, is evenly spread and so on. Um, and the reason you would do that is then you can, you know, you can split out incoming transactions out against that account um, and, and process them in parallel against the two different accounts. Um, so that's the other, the other problem. Uh, third problem is um, the distance between the data and the code. So uh, when you use generic databases um, or data stores, you generally have a lot of your business logic in the, in the application and the code and you have your um, data obviously sitting in the database and so you have lots and lots of round trips back and forward to uh, complete a transfer first you know validating uh, the contents of the transfer against what's in the current state in the database then making sure you lock that state so that it doesn't change while you're processing your business logic then you know um, actually uh, making the necessary changes, ensuring that that's all atomic, releasing locks, et cetera. Um, the, every time you do a round trip, um, you, you know, you're faced with the delays of using the network, but not only that, your um, processor is doing a lot of, you know, context switching. So within your application, so you're switching from writing and reading to the network to actually processing data and back and forth. Um, so that that actually adds, you know, that adds up as well. Uh, on top of that, if you have your um, your uh, hey John, um, so as on top of that, if you have your application separated from your data, you um, potentially end up with differences in your system clocks. If your application goes down and comes up again, good chance the system clock is now different to what it was before, um, and so potentially, you know 
transactions that you have in the database no longer make sense because they've got timestamps that are ahead of what your system considers the current time, all sorts of weird things like that. Uh, it also makes potentially makes the whole system harder to test. Um, you know, your you want to test the atomic output of a transfer. Um, but you've got uh, lots of moving parts and interdependencies and, and it's generally just error prone. So, um, you know, whenever a developer has to build a system that does all of these things, they generally have to re-implement it. There isn't sort of an off the shelf, um, here's standard accounting logic in a, in a library um, and a sort of standardized pattern for using, you know, a, a key value store or a database to, to do the persistence. Um, and so, this tends to be re-implemented every time somebody needs something that does this. And, and uh, obviously that's you know, error prone. Um, a more subtle problem and one that's probably not well known and, and you know, Joran can probably add some color here is that the sort of layers of abstraction we've gotten used to in, in building systems have made us maybe somewhat naive or, 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 or ignorant of the potential failures and layers that we just assume are, are safe. So um, this is a, you know, the abstract of a recent paper presented at the Usenix conference, which talks about these kinds of failures. Um, and here we're talking about things like um, simply writing to disk and, and the failures that can happen from assuming that a disk write succeeded and then uh, finding out that later that actually didn't. And the, the, the reality that many well-known systems that we all sort of trust to be safe um, actually have, um, uh, Ha have the propensity to to fail in this way, and and the point that um, Joran was making to me the other day is that a lot of these systems have been well tested in terms of thinking about what can happen on the network and failures that can happen in the network, but very few of them have really thought about storage failures and and what um, can happen there and how they can actually recover from those. So that's a you know that's a fourth class of problem we want to solve. So our motivation with um, with Tiger Beetle is is really around these three pillars, uh, safety. So making sure that everything we do and everything that the clients um, are notified that we've done has been done safely. It's, it's, uh, it's immutable, the, um, it's recoverable, it's replicated, uh, you know, the, the system is, is like rock solid or as, you know, as best as we can get it. Um, then you know the compromise obviously is performance and what we try to do is see you know if we prioritize safety we want to prioritize performance next but not compromise performance entirely and so you'll see we've done a lot to try and really um, tweak the performance at every possible corner that we can uh, where we're not compromising on safety and finally we've we've taken um, uh, developer and operator experiences being you know really important tenets of what we do so uh, we want the use of Tiger Beetle to be easy. We want the maintenance operating of Tiger Beetle to be, to be simple. You know, many um, similar systems um, that are used for, you know, scale, high, high scale uh, applications are really complex and difficult to operate and run. They come with, uh, you know, terrible defaults. They, um, you know, are either optimized for production or for, you know, development environments. And it's not obvious how you get them into the right state for one or the other. So on the safety side, um, and I'm going to stop at the end of each of these, Jordan, feel free to, to add some commentary here. Um, we're using a replicated state machine. Um, so the way Tiger Beetle works is you will run multiple instances. They'll communicate with each other. Um, it's following the classics of LMAX design, and uh, you'll have a leader, um, which is the, the instance that your clients will talk to. Um, and they will replicate all um, events to, uh, to the other uh, instances. They'll wait for a, a quorum of acts from those before they then start to execute the business logic um, and return the result to, uh, return the, result to, the, to the client. Um, we, to avoid clock skew, the leader is responsible for the clock and only the leader. So the interfaces um, don't allow you to specify any timestamps. Uh, all of our interfaces only accept durations of time and timestamping is done by the leader. Um, so that helps us to avoid clock skew issues. Uh, we're following the view stamp replication model for leader elections and reconfiguration of the clusters. Um, 
So that's still a bit of a work in progress, but John's I think making good progress on that. And uh, and and there's some you know this is a well established um, uh, pattern for for doing this. Uh, and then a slight variation on that that we've adopted um, is instead of sequences, we're using hash chains. Uh, so our journal entries um, are stored in a hash chain, and we can detect you know disk corruption or even you know malicious. Um, changes to the data that's stored on disk. Uh, so that's yeah. the those are the safety aspects. John, anything you want to add there? Yeah, thanks, Adrian. So, so like Adrian touched on earlier, one of the problems when you straddle the network, when you've got data on one side and code on the other, is that it becomes harder to test your system because you've now got to test that your logic is safe as it's going back and forth over the network. Um, so one of the nice fallouts from just using a classical data structure like a replicated state machine is that the state machine itself on the inside is, is pure functional. It's, it takes inputs in the function and it gives you an output. So you can test the business logic a lot easier um, because you know that within your state machine, you don't have any IO happening. There's no disk IO, there's no network IO. Um, so it's the three steps, you know, you first replicate, then you each of those nodes write to disk and only after that's done, you run it through your state machine. Um, but that's a lot, it, it's, it's a lot easier to test. Um, and we do the testing for the developers. Um, yeah, and then the other thing, just like Adrian said, so the, the hash chain journal entries, um, it's just the same as views, as VR, view stamp replication. But instead of sequential integers, we use big cryptographic 128 bit numbers. And so that if we get the the consensus protocol wrong, um, which is easy to do, then we're still protected by the hash chain. So we um, things won't work. Um, it, it, it just gives us much stronger confidence. And, and then also besides description, you get misdirected rights. Um, and that's something that a lot of software doesn't handle. So most of the replicated state machines like Zookeeper or um, Log Cabin by the author of Raft, None of them, as far as I know, handle corruption. Or if they do, they don't do it properly. But none of them really handle misdirected writes. So where you tell the disk, you know, write to this sector, it actually writes somewhere totally out, to totally different. Um, and then when you read sectors, you can you can get into really all interesting scenarios where one you, you're reading a sector and the checksum matches. So you don't pick up the corruption, but actually you're reading a sector that's in the totally wrong place. Um, so that's like an order of magnitude less likely than disk corruption, but it still happens. Um, so there's only very few systems can can detect it, and that one of them is ZFS. Um, so yeah, um, but uh, that's that's the sure. safety side. So yeah, so so um, that's that's how we've dealt with safety. And I mean, we can maybe once after the demo, um, Joran, there we can we can have a bit of Q and A about some of these details as well if they're they're questions. Um, on the performance side, uh, I think you know one of the biggest benefits we or one of the the major uh, like design decisions we've made here, or which is kind of the nature of the whole product, is to build this thing for purpose. And what that's done is dramatically simplify um, the, the domain in which we're working. So, you know, we only have two data structures, for example, we have an account and we have a transfer. So you think about that compared to, you know, other um, databases or storage engines, um, you know, they, they have to deal with a lot more complexity. Um, and this makes, this makes things like, um, you know, maintaining a deterministic state in our state machine based on events that much easier because events are either a create transfer or a create a, a account. Um, and so the effects of those on the state are very, very easy to model. And, and, and you know, we, we can, the code is easy to read, the, the business logic is easy to understand. Uh, and what it also means is we can build all of our business logic into the database. So there's only so many things you can do with an account and a transfer and, and you know, the accounting business logic is relatively straightforward. So that allows us to build those in and bring, you know, as we've mentioned before, the business logic and the data um, very close together. 
Uh, and you'll see, um, if we have time, we can show you a couple of those data structures, what they actually look like and how we're simply using flags to indicate subtle differences in business logic that you may have um, between you know, one account creation and another or one transfer and another. Uh, the second thing we're doing to improve performance, and this came from uh, some experimentation in the Moduli project, um, is batching. So one of the ways you can very quickly improve performance is simply to amortize all of your network and storage um, costs. So you, you know, rather than uh, sending each transfer one by one through the database or through your accounting system, you collect a few of them and send them, send them off in a batch. Uh, and, and even if you're you know, waiting you know, 50 milliseconds um, to fill the batch, if you're operating a very, very high throughput, you, chances are you've, you're putting a decent number of transfers into your batch uh, and sending those off. And that means it's a single network request versus a network request for each one. Uh, and that's, you know, we've, we've proven that to be extremely uh, valuable in improving performance in just some basic, simple experiments with Moduli. And then, um, you know, Jordan, I think maybe Jordan can talk through some of these optimized IO um, tweaks we've made, but the, the, the crux of this is uh, a lot of, you know, subtle um, things we've done in the code, or Jordan has done, should I say, in the code to uh, ensure that at every turn we're, we're, you know, doing things in the most performant way we can. Uh, we've designed our data structures that way, so fixed size data structures. Um, and then, you know, Jordan, I don't know if you want to talk through yeah. the use of direct IO and IOU ring and so on. Um, yeah, sure. So, so as Don would say, these are almost just the cherry on the top. So the, the you know, like um, the simple data structures, that's a huge reason, um, accounts transfers. We actually had a blob in there too, and Matt convinced us to get rid of that. Um, but the, the biggest win is the batching um, that, because um, you get little costs all the way through. Um, you get context switches as you handle a network packet. You've got the TCP, you know, header, um, overhead, CPU. You've got um, uh, cache, cache line misses, um, f syncs. You've got all of these little costs everywhere. And if you just start doing 10 transfers at a time, you amortize all those costs by 10. You do 100 transfers at a time. Now you've got a factor of 100. So batching is the, it's just huge what you can get with that. So but then the optimized IO, that's really like cherry on the top, but it's still a decent cherry. So direct IO gets us like a 7% win. Um, it also gets us a lot more safety because we can handle F-sync failure properly um, when the page cache lies. Um, so we can do from the incoming network request, we can write to disk, apply to state and write back to the socket all with two buffers and zero copy. So we, we have to copy from kernel space to user space because we're not doing user space TCP, um, but otherwise within Tiger Beetle, it's zero copy. Um, then we're using IOU ring, so zero syscalls. It's just zero everything, <laughs> uh, zero syscalls. And syscalls have a huge cost these days thanks to Spectre. Um, and, and we've got interesting benchmarks where if you're doing like sector sized F syncs or writes or things, you actually get a double throughput improvement just switching to IOU ring. That's just syscall cost. And as your disk device gets super fast, your syscalls start to be the same order of magnitude. Um, so you just win and win. And IOU ring is really nice and simple. So um, we use that for network and for storage. Then zero deserialization. It's almost like cheating because we just don't do deserialization. So we don't pay for that cost. Um, we just have fixed size structures. They're 128 kilobytes. They're cache, cache line aligned, um, multiples of 64 bytes. And we just point a pointer at them and hydrate and that's it, deserialization is done. So the code's also easy. Um, it's almost embarrassing. It's, it's really, really fun. <laughs> yeah, over to you, Adrian. <laughs> So, so the the third pillar, as I said, was uh, experience. And here we we're talking about user experience in the general sense, developers, operators, and so on. So um, first things first, uh, keep the keep keep it to a single binary. Binary. You download Tiger Beetle, you run the server, and there you go, you have it. And and we try and um, you know the the 
tool chain with Zig uh, appears to be incredibly simple and easy to use. So, you know, the one thing you may want to do is have a sort of very customized config. You can um, you can tweak that a single Zig file and recompile Tiger Beetle um, to create a new uh, config profile if you want to. But the other thing we try to do is have uh, same defaults. So really, you know, optimized um, configuration profiles so that if you're running in a development environment, then you just tell uh, Tiger Beetle, this is a development environment. And all of the uh, configurable bits are um, automatically set to defaults that we consider sort of best for development and then likewise for production. And so those will obviously evolve over time, but the idea is ship Tiger Beetle with a number of profiles, allow developers or operators or whoever to, to um, not need to you know, pass in a whole uh, file full of environment variables or maintain a configuration file or whatever the case may be. Um, that stuff uh, straightforward. And then uh, the Tiger Beetle client uh, which currently is, is written in TypeScript and we you know, would like to obviously um, keep refining that as the interface goes, um, would make the uh, use of Tiger Beetle from an application as simple as possible. So you, you know, throw in commands like create an account or you know, create transfers. The client will you know, gather those all up, batch them as necessary, um, pass them in and, and then um, the client will also deal with responses that tell it the cluster configuration might have changed. So if the client happens to be speaking to a node that's no longer the leader, it will automatically um, figure out how to connect to the correct node and so on. Uh, and then finally, the, the, the API that you would use is, is um, very domain specific. So rather than you know, the experience of uh, SQL queries or you know, very generic um, command language uh, like you would be used to in a key value store, um, it's very straightforward. You're either creating accounts or you're creating transfers. And, uh, and the capabilities you have there are mostly driven around flags uh, and the um, code uh, will protect you from doing anything that would break uh, business rules. So, you know, we've got already a fairly long list of error codes you'll get back. Uh, and whenever you call um, the API, if you're trying to, for example, submit a transaction twice or um, you know, transfer money out of an account that doesn't have the appropriate balance or whatever the case may be, you, you know, you'll, you'll get a response back to tell you. Um, anything you want to add there, John? Yeah, just a useless fact. Uh, so on the simple tool chain, um, Zig is really, um, like we were, we were thinking of writing Tiger Beetle in C, so we can have control over memory layouts and things like that. Um, but Zig has just got such a great um, compiler. It's so easy. You can cross compile um, from Mac to Windows to Linux to, you know, obscure architectures. Not that this is relevant, you know, but but in future, you know, it, it's just really easy. So even um, even the new Apple Silicon, um, the M1 chip, um, this is one of the first compilers that can compile for that and do your, your code signing for you and everything. Um, ah, but it's just, yeah, yeah, it was one of the reasons why we went with SIG, just to make it a really nice experience, single binary, easy compilation. Yeah, no, no dependencies. No rust. <laughs> Sorry, man. Would, would have been great. Um, yeah, so uh, this is, I think, my last slide before I think we should get into a demo. Um, in terms of the API, as I said, you know, very simple. Uh, they're basically three commands. You can create an account, you can create a transfer, and very recently, John added uh, lookups, so you can get the current state of, of uh, an account or accounts. Um, as I've mentioned, the commands are submitted in batches, uh, but for uh, as an optimization, you will submit the batch uh, of commands, and what you get back is a response that is a batch of acts, except everything is uh, only, only the errored um, responses are returned. So if you submit a batch of 10,000 you know, transfers um, and only one fails, your response is very small. It's only gonna give you the index of the transfer that failed and the error code. Uh, and you can just assume that if you got the batch ACK that everything else has been successfully um, processed, which I think is quite a nice uh, little bit of efficiency as well. Uh, and that's it, John. I don't know if you want to add anything more, and then I can hand over screen sharing to you for uh, for the demo.
yeah, let's do the demo. Okay, cool. Uh, are you Let's able to share a screen? Uh, I'm going to share the whole desktop. Um, okay. Let's see. Yeah, we got it. Okay, so you're seeing Ubuntu 20 running on a Mac. Okay, great. So, like what, yeah. Okay, so this is um, so because of um, you know while we while we develop. Um, Alpha Beetle, Beta Beetle, we, we, we're sticking to IOU ring on Linux for now. So Linux is a, is a requirement and we need one of the newer kernels for IOU ring. Um, so we're gonna launch Tiger Beetle. Um, this is gonna launch a new instance of the database and we've set the log level to debug. So we're gonna get huge amounts of log data here. Um, this is the journal file that's being pre-allocated um, we actually, we, we do static allocation for memory. So at runtime, there's no dynamic allocation of memory, but something interesting we're doing is that we're doing static allocation of disk sectors as well. So at runtime, we don't allocate files in the file system or anything like that. Everything is pre-allocated. So once you've launched Tiger Beetle, it can't fail. Um, you're not gonna get out of space errors or, or um, out of memory errors or anything like that. Um, and then, yeah, here you can see the, the journal being written with the empty end of file. Um, you can think of the journal like a ring buffer. Um, and here are our hash chain roots and the database is empty and we're listening through our hearing. And now I'm just gonna show you, I've got a few demos lined up. Um, so let me know if you can now see Sublime. Um, yeah. Can you almost yeah, we can see it. Okay. okay, great. So this is just showing you, um, this is kind of like a um, Zig is remarkably a lot like JavaScript with the power of C. Um, so we're importing Tiger Beetle's types and I've just got a bit of demo helper functions that'll let us connect to the server on the port. Um, we just get a file descriptor, nice Unix. Um, and here are two accounts that we're gonna test with. Um, account ID one, these are 128 bit numbers. We're just doing one and two for now. And then the unit is just the unit of value like gold bars, marbles. Here we're gonna use just something that means something to us. Uh, ISO 4217 is the code for South African Rand. Uh, and this account number one, we're gonna have a nice limit on in-flight transfers so that people can't tie up liquidity. So we'll say, okay, you're allowed to have it at least at most 100,000 units in flight that have, that have been prepared, but not committed. And you're allowed to have a million units on the debit balance that have been committed. Um, this account, we're gonna give it an opening credit balance of 900,000. And it's got an in-flight credit limit of 200,000 units. And it's got a nice fat um, accepted credit limit of, of uh, 2 billion for nice exposure. And then we're gonna send these into Tiger Beetle, say, let's create accounts, pass the accounts. And this is the type we expect back. And we're gonna see them, you know, this printed out in the terminal when we run the demo. So what we're gonna see in the terminal is a network ACK, the, the ACK header, and plus any error codes that we get back. Um, so let's run this first demo. Um, let's create some accounts and we get the ACK. Um, so that's it, we're all good. Our two accounts have been created and our ACK, the, the packet size was 64 bytes. And something interesting, I looked up the average size of HTTP request response headers. It's about 800 bytes one way. Um, so this is just you know a 10th of that um, just for free. Um, and let's look at the server, what it actually did. So you can see we got a connection that came in. Um, we received into our receive buffer from the connection 320 bytes. We passed it. We got the request header, um, which was three, the request was 320 bytes in total, the 64 byte header plus the data. Um, the command is create accounts. The leader assigned timestamps to the two accounts. Then we journaled it to disk um, and we wrote the journal header redundantly in, at two two offsets. So we wrote it at the head of the log, we wrote it aligned to a disk sector, 
Um, even though it's smaller than a disk sector, we do direct IO, so everything has to be sector aligned. Um, then we wrote it to the body of the log. Um, and here we're actually running it through the state machine, so creating a count one of two. Um, and the result was, okay, uh, two of two, okay. And now we do the back header back and we send um, our send buffer. And then we see if the peer has got anything more to send and they don't, and they close the TCP connection in an orderly manner. And the nice thing here is all of this is just one receive from the network. And then the state machine writes into the send buffer and we send it back. And that's like literally how simple it is. Um, and now if we run this command again, now we get a 60, we get an 80, 80 byte response. It's the 64 byte header plus 16 bytes of data, four bytes, four bytes, four bytes, and four bytes, and both accounts exist. Um, and now let's look up our account balances. Um, and that looks like this. So all, all these demos are in the repo if you want to try them out. You can just change the, you know, change what we're passing in here. Um, so we literally pass in two numbers. They're both 128 bit. Um, so account one and two, let's split them up. Um, let's run that. And there they are. So we get our ACK header back. Um, and then we get our data, account one and account two. And the data hasn't been corrupted. All the balances and limits are correct. Um, and next demo, uh, we're going to look at just, so this is the simplest thing you could do. Once you've got some accounts, you just want to write journal entries to them. And you don't even want to do two-phase commits. You just, you know, the entries you want to send in and you send them in. So he has a transfer. This was Matt's idea to auto-commit, um, which is pretty cool. You can set the flag on the transfer to auto-commit. Um, and you can say you want it to accept, which is what you have to do if you auto commit. You can, you can set the amount to a thousand units and we're debiting account one and crediting account two. The idea of this transfer is a thousand. Um, and the interesting thing is flags here in the struct is a 64, byte, uh, a 64 bit integer. Um, but Zig's pretty cool. You can do um, packed structs over an integer and you end up that each one of these flags is actually taking up one bit, but you can use it really easy. You don't have to do bitwise flags or anything like that. So I, I just realized, Joran, I, I, I told a little lie in my API slide. We actually have four, um, we actually have four commands. I, I, I forgot about uh, create commits or commit transfer. Okay. So, well, luckily, you're going to give a demo of that. So yeah, I'm no, going to no. go and fix that slide. Oh, no worries. Yeah, we, um, yeah, we, we, we've got we've got commits also, and there's also an interesting reason why. You know, on top of not just having order commits, but we'll get to that. Um, the so let let's send this one in. We're going to create create transfers, and these are going to order commit, and there's just one we're sending in. Um, okay, next one. Let's run it, and that's it. It's done. Sixty four byte ACK, and um, we can see what happened here. Great transfers one of one, um, all good. Um, now we probably want to look at some account balances. So let's see what changed. Um, here are our accounts again. Um, we can see now debit accepted was zero um, for account one, now it's a thousand. Um, so it worked. Let's check the credit account. Um, credit accepted has gone from 900,000 to 901,000, so that worked. And we're good. Um, okay, so that's that's the the easiest kind of transfer you can do. Um, but what makes Tiger Beetle a bit more than old school accounting is that we've got the new school accounting also. So we've got the the two phase commit stuff, which is what we you know is really handy for Interledger. Um, so here's a two phase commit. Um, it starts off again. You create the transfers. This is the prepare. So we're going to create two transfers. They're just going to prepare. They're not going to commit. Um, we've got debiting account one, credit two, ID 1001, 1002. This one is 100,000 units. This one is one unit. And we're just going to do half of the two phase. We're going to get to the, the commit side just now. Um, let's go and create some two phase transfers. OK, so. The first one worked. Um, the second one with index one that failed. 
because we exceeded the debit reserved limit. Um, because remember the first, first transfer here was doing 100,000 units and the debit reserved limit was 100,000. So you can have up to 100,000 units in flight, which is what we've got after we run the first, after we create the first transfer. When we try and do the second transfer here, it's got a, a amount of one and now we're 100,001, which exceeds the limit. Um, now, if we try and run this again, we both of them will, will exceed the limit. Um, and let's look at our account balances now. Um, now you won't see these numbers reflected in the accepted amount. We're going to see it reflected in the reserved amounts. So we've got we've gone from zero to a hundred thousand in-flight debits for this account, and we've gone from um, credit accepted, credit reserved of zero over here, um, to credit reserved of a hundred thousand but it's not actually in the credit accepted balance. Um, this is all in flight. Um, so let's um, accept these transfers. And this is our missing data struct, which we haven't shown yet, but this basically, if you've seen a transfer, you've seen a commit. A commit is just an ID and you can pass some custom slots and flags. Um, so this is really nice. The reason why you want this and not just auto commits is because sometimes like with Mojo Loop, I think even with Interledger, I'm not sure, but you, you, you only get the ID of, of you know, the, the, what you want to fulfill. Um, well, Mojo Loop for sure, you, you only, you know, when the fulfill comes in, you just get an ID. So you, if you wanted to do an auto commit transfer to express this, you would then need to first do a lookup to the database to get your transfer before you can then commit it. But with this commit um, command, you just have to pass in the ID and you save a network hop. Um, so here we're gonna commit both and, and accept them. We could also, if we want, reject one um, and we send it in the command is commit transfers. Here the commits and let's see, let's see what happens. Okay, these are gonna be, we're gonna be committing them and accepting. Um, and here the first one succeeds and the second one we get a um, error back transfer not found because it failed the first time it didn't prepare because it hit the in-flight limit um, and if we run this again then we get something where we told it's already committed um, and that's it now let's do so I'm looking up of account balances, which is what we want to do with Tiger Beetle. That's the, the whole main, main use case. Um, now our accounts have got a nice big balance in them. Um, so debit accepted was 1,000, now it's 101,000. And it's the debit reserved has gone from 100,000 to zero. And then the same happened on the credit side. Um, and now let's just assume that somehow some other node tried to actually commit also, um, but with a reject um, concurrently to this accept. Um, so that looks pretty much the same, but they were trying to commit this transfer, but reject it. And now let's see what happens. Now Tiger Beetle tells us it's already committed and we tried to reject it, but whoever committed it, they actually accepted it. So you get a little bit more information entropy coming across the wire in the error code. It doesn't just tell you it's committed, but it, it'll tell you how it differs to what you were trying to do. Um, so it saves you hops. Um, and yeah, that's our, that's our demo. Um, should we go back to the awesome. slides? Thanks, John. Yeah, we've got, um, we've only got 10 minutes left. I wonder, if, are there any questions anyone has? Um, before, before we run out of time. Hey Adrian, yeah, I have, I have a bunch of questions. Um, I, I'm looking on the GitHub repo <clears throat> and there were some performance numbers tossed out for like Alpha Beetle, Beetle and such. Uh, do you have any feeling for what Tiger Beetle can do in terms of TPS? So the, the, the next slide I was gonna show is actually the output of a benchmark. So let me do that. Um, but yeah, Joran can, Joran can give you all the disclaimers. Um, 
on on this uh, on this benchmark. Let me just find there. Uh, yeah, there so, we go. Yeah, we would have wanted to run it for you live, but then what we found when we do these calls is that um, you know the video and audio um, of the call changes the benchmark numbers because it's tying up the stack, the network stack. Um, so law of demos, we've, we've put it in as a slide. And so the benchmark, it's not super optimized. We could make the benchmark client a lot more optimized. Um, and we're only sending in a million transfers. We should probably send in like 10 million or 100 million, but we need to still set up some some hot, you know, some hardware. This is just on our office laptops. So this is sending in a million transfers and we can do half a million a second. And um, the latency, the worst case latency um, is about 15 to 20 milliseconds per batch. Um, so we're using batch sizes here of 10,000 transfers a batch. And across all these million transfers, there's quite a few batches at 10,000. The, the P100 latency was is 15 to 20 milliseconds. Um, and we can still get that down. And this is again, you just you know, office laptops. And this is running ZIG in, in release safe mode. So we've got full, all our assertions are there, um, all the bounds checking and a lot of memory safety is there. Um, and yeah, and if you, these are all two phase commits. So you, yeah, this is actually two commands into Tiger Beetle. Um, if we do auto committing transfers, then this would be over a million a second. Are these all into uh, between two accounts or is this 1 million accounts? Um, this is between two accounts. Um, so it would be interesting to see with like memory locality and cache misses if we're starting to randomize the workload and use more accounts. But it shouldn't be too, um, too much difference. Um, um, but we we're gonna get into into that. Yeah, yeah I, I wouldn't read I, I wouldn't read too much into these numbers other than just like indications because I think yeah. there's a lot we could do to create a sort of sanitized performance test environment and try a bunch. Like Joran says, I think it would be worth doing like sustained load for a longer period of time. Um, sure you know, much higher number of transactions, vary the number of accounts, um, you know, and, and also try some different business logic, but we're still sort of implementing some of that stuff. So, you know, some auto commits, some two-phase commits, um, and also, um, you know, making sure we're testing, uh, for example, a cluster of, let's say five nodes with quorum of three and making sure you know, we have the full safety as well. What's our benchmark? Those kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah. This, this um, one is a single node, um, but we're doing full F sync um, and full cryptographic checks, checksums, everything. So if we were to do a cluster, um, we would have a slightly just a small network hop, um, but the F syncs all run in parallel, um, and we 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 take the three fastest of the five. Um, so we've got the tail tolerance of the latencies also. So the numbers shouldn't be too too far off. Yeah, yeah this is great. The, the, big benefit is, the big benefit is the is the batching there, obviously. Like when you when you're batching stuff together and only and sending it out to your replicas in big batches, you you're saving a lot on round trips. So so my follow-up here, like the the single account transfers per second are incredible. I'm imagining um, like a, a beefy connector, like let's say it had um, 10 accounts that it wanted to do like 527,000 per second on. How, how, does, how does one scale Tiger Beetle across accounts? Is it just like you can horizontally scale that way or, or no? Yeah, it would be fine. Um... Uh, David, if you had like 100,000 accounts in Tiger Beetle, um, 100,000 accounts would be, I think, 10 megs. So that would all fit in the L3 cache probably, uh, as my maths, right? 100,000 times 128. But, but you know, having 1,000 accounts, in, it's not a problem. Um, you could do a million accounts. It's fine. We, we're designing these hash tables to scale up to 128 gigabytes. 
um, so that we can do a billion transfers um, in in one node. Um, so it should it should all be it should just handle it fine. Um, and we and yeah, even hundred thousand accounts, you're still within the CPU cache and shouldn't uh, degrade. Oh, oh, sorry, David. I, I guess you're going about there. Yeah. Yeah. Like if I look at this number, um, if you had this amount of transfers on one account, you're you're at five hundred twenty-seven thousand per second. I'm assuming you can't do you, you can't do more on that account. Something is limited. But if you were to start pushing date, uh, transfers into a, a second account, um, is, are we hitting a file system limit here, or are we hitting a CPU limit, or could you do another five hundred thousand per second on a second account? I guess that'd be like uh, okay. Part okay. One. No, yeah, that's a good question. Sorry, I'm, I misunderstood. Um, so, so this is the total number of transfers per second, regardless of accounts. So, for the system, um, you could do five hundred thousand a second between two accounts, or um, you would divide that number if you were doing it between more. But, but you, you, you're still in total. At the end of the day, um, you're going to be doing five hundred thousand a second um yeah yeah it, it and so, it, you yeah but you would you would only be able to do five hundred thousand a second between two accounts not it, you, that number wouldn't increase as you add accounts yeah there's there's yeah. currently nothing being done in parallel inside a single node and i think the current solution would be if you need more than this and you have multiple accounts you could shard by account and you could run multiple tiger beetle clusters where you have some accounts on one cluster and some on the other, and you would probably do your sharding logic in the client or something like that. But okay. yeah, this yeah, is a, this going. is a ceiling. This is a seal like a per node ceiling. Um, everything is processed like in 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 in, a, in serial. Um, we yeah. aren't trying to do anything internally in Tiger Beetle to like parallelize transfers on different accounts. Cool. Yeah, in fact, John, like I don't a... know if you want to, if you we, we've only got like a couple of minutes, but I don't know if you want to mention sort of the approach around uh, single threading and, and so on um, from a safety yeah. perspective. We didn't really touch on that. Yeah, yeah. So um, the, the what we do is everything is single writer. So we use one thread per core. Um, so we don't do multi-threading, that kind of thing, but we use multiple CPU cores but on each core we have one thread and we keep it hot. We don't context switch. Um, and at the moment, everything is single threaded, but we're planning to split the journaling replication and state machine across three threads. And then um, if we need more background stuff, we can have more threads, but um, that's, that's the nice thing. So all this code, we don't, we don't actually need like Rust's borrow checker for safety because we, we kind of doing that, we only have a single owner um, we, we're not doing multi-threading there. Yeah. Sorry, David, I cut you off and, and you've only got a minute or so left. Um, was there anything else you wanted to ask there? No, no, I think you covered it. I okay. have like 10 more questions though, so. Uh, <laughs> well, let's, let's pick them up um, on the, uh, e either on the forum or um, maybe we can start a Tiger Beetle channel on the Slack as well, the, the IRP yeah, Slack. That'd be awesome. We've, um, we've had one going into a coil for a while, but, but I mean, it would be great to get more broad input on this. Um, that is unfortunately all we have time for. Thanks, Joran. Um, awesome job as, <laughs> as usual. Um, we had one last slide there, which actually didn't have much on it, but I just mentioned that sort of one of the things we, we still want to do is um, make sort of queryability easier. And our, our current thinking is to drain the data from Tiger Beetle into something like a, a database or um, a more sort of appropriate uh, system for kind of taking, taking read-only views of the data. Um, so we have a few ideas that we'll look into there, but right now your one query command is the account lookup. So that gets you current state of an account, you know, at, at that point in time. Um, but really, if you want like to pull, you know, data about previous transactions and so on, that would probably come from these materialized views that would sit in, in an alternative data store. And we would have a way of draining to that, but still, yeah. Uh, any thoughts on how to do that or input would be appreciated. Um, cool, let's leave it there. We, we're out of time. Thanks everyone. Um, I think it'd be great to have another another call in two weeks before everyone starts to go on holiday. Um, so 
with that in mind, our next call will be the 9th of December, um, same time, same place. And uh, yeah, look forward to it. This, um, this presentation, uh, we'll get the recording and put it up on Cinnamon ASAP. We're just waiting for a confirmation from Brianna that they've got an Interledger Foundation account set up on Cinnamon. So we're gonna get um, a couple of previous presentations up there too, as soon as we can. Thanks everyone. And we'll chat again in a couple of weeks. Thanks everyone. Ciao. Thank you, bye.